So, I inherited a machine shop, like a full-blown machine shop, capable of making just about anything I can think of out of metal. But that means there is a lot of equipment. So where did I put it all? Obviously, I put it in a shop, but how exactly that came to be requires a little bit of a backstory. A few years ago, my wife and I bought a property that included a rundown Victorian farmhouse, as well as several other buildings. One of the buildings on the property was a partially enclosed pole barn with a concrete floor. I say partially because, well, look at it. While I'm grateful to not be starting completely from scratch, I couldn't just plop these high-precision machines down in this environment. They'd be rusted and mouse-ridden within weeks. I needed something better. So what did I do? I built a building within a building. Crazy, right? Really thinking outside the barn, I mean box, here. I divided the interior space of the pole barn in half and framed one side of it into a fully enclosed room. During our house renovation, we replaced the front door, so I used this to make a single access door into the shop. Farmhouse style doesn't quite go with the machinist aesthetic, but hey, waste not, want not. Now let's get into some of the equipment. In the far back corner of the shop sits the mill. If you saw my last video, this machine may look familiar. It's what's called a vertical knee mill, knee referring to this bit, which I guess is supposed to look like a knee. Anyway, knee mills have a table that can move precisely in three axes, X, which is left and right, Y, front and back, and Z, which is up and down. The part can be held to the table with various clamping devices, and then the table is moved into a stationary but rotating cutting bit, which also happens to be called a mill. How clever. The table moves with a series of threaded shafts that are rotated by hand wheels. Each hand wheel has a dial on it indicating the position down to the thousandth of an inch. But these dials can be a bit misleading due to something called lash. Lash is just the technical term for the looseness in the threaded shafts, and it's especially apparent when changing direction. To help with this problem, this mill came equipped with a digital readout, DRO for short. This device measures the actual location of the table with digital scales, totally bypassing the lash of the hand wheel mechanisms. This mill in particular is an ENCO 100-1599, and it stands over 7 feet tall and is 6 feet deep. With a 15 inch wide table, this is not a small machine. In fact, you probably notice it's quite a bit larger than the door in the shop. So how the heck did I get it in here? Well, I did what any guy with a miter saw on a pile of lumber would do. I made a bigger door. During the framing of the shop, I strategically arranged the wall studs so that one section was a standalone panel that could be removed as needed. I should point out that a running theme of my handiwork is that I try to hold metalworking tolerances when building with wood. As a result, this panel is very snug. Snug fit or not, this panel was an absolute lifesaver when it actually came time to bring the machines in. The 8 foot wide opening left plenty of clearance for rolling everything into place with room to spare. The mill tucks nicely into the back corner of the shop and just a few feet to the right of it sits the lathe. Lathes are kind of the opposite of mills. Mills move the part into a rotating cutting bit, but lathes move the cutting bit into a rotating part. The result is that your part comes out round, which hopefully you plan for. Like the mill, hand wheels position the cutting bit relative to the part. But also like mills, lathes have the same problem with lash. Fortunately, this machine also has a DRO, which helps make accurate cuts to within one one thousandth of an inch. As a rule, lathes have hand wheels for feeding the cutting bit in the X and Y directions, but not in the Z. So what could this third hand wheel be used for? How about a feed in the X and Y simultaneously? That'd be pretty cool, right? The third one is called the compound slide because you can set it at a compound angle and move the cutting bit in the X and Y direction simultaneously. This beats the hell out of trying to move the X and Y hand wheels at the same time. And it's a great way to make tapered parts. This lathe is a JMT 360 by 1000 
which theoretically means it has a capacity to hold a part 360 millimeters in diameter and 1,000 millimeters long. Only theoretically though, because I will never be turning a part that big in this lathe. Oops, don't do that. Now while this lathe runs, it definitely needs a thorough cleanup and de-rusting. More to come on that. Unfortunately, that's what happens when bare iron is exposed to humid air. It rusts. I wouldn't want to spend hours scouring these surfaces just for them to flash rust overnight. If only there was something that could remove humidity from the air. Oh wait, there is, and is aptly named a dehumidifier. This one has a pump that sends all the captured water outside through a tube, and it's rated for a room about four times the size of this shop, because I have a tendency to overdo things. Speaking of overdoing things, have you met the surface grinder? It's good for a grand total of one thing, turning flat parts into flatter parts. Because when one one thousandth of an inch isn't good enough, this will get you to within one ten thousandth of an inch. Do I have something in mind that requires this level of accuracy? Nope, but I still need it, for reasons. This surface grinder in particular is a TurnPro 120-6818, powered by a 1.5 horsepower three-phase motor. It includes a dust collector and a coolant pump, and this unit also came mounted with a nifty magnetic vise. Surface grinders work by moving your part past a grinding wheel spinning in the neighborhood of 4,000 RPM. There is a drive in the table that shuttles the part left and right while indexing forward and backward incrementally until you've covered the entire part. I would show you this, but currently the table drive mechanism is broken, so hopefully you get the idea. Now a ten thousandth of an inch is a very small number. Think about cutting a hair from your head into 20 even slivers lengthwise, and you will soon appreciate just how small this actually is. In order for this machine to achieve this level of precision, there are a few factors that play an important role. The first is depth of cut, or how much material you're taking off with each pass. Since the grinding wheel is typically of stone of some sort, the stone wears down over time. It would be bad if this wear were to happen in the middle of running apart. One side would end up higher than the other. To reduce this wear, the amount of material removed with each pass is kept as low as reasonable, usually somewhere around one to two thousandths. This keeps the load on the wheel low, which extends its life, but also prevents too much heat from building up within the part which introduces the next factor to consider, temperature, which can actually cause metals to change in size. Proper setup and technique can only go so far if the temperature of the shop isn't held somewhat constant. 20 degrees in the winter is definitely not conducive to precise machining, mostly because I'll be inside my warm house, not in the shop. Luckily I splurged and insulated the entire shop, and better yet, I repurposed the old wood stove that we removed from the house during renovation. After several uses this winter, I can tell you, it definitely lives up to its name. The last of what I call the big machines is the bandsaw. Not only is this machine physically big, but it also requires big electricity. I'll explain in a moment. At their core, all bandsaws work the same. A thin blade is connected end to end making a loop, or band, that is pulled tight over a series of pulleys. One of these pulleys is powered by a motor that in turn causes the blade to move. But unlike a common handsaw where you have to go back and forth, a bandsaw only has to move in one direction because the blade is continuous and has been outfitted with roller bearing guides for the blade and also came stocked with a blade welder, which is not only good for repairing broken blades, but it can also be used for making your own. The motor powering this saw is a two horsepower three phase motor. The mill, lathe, and grinder also run off of three phase motors, and this is where the big electricity comes in. To run a three phase motor, you need three phase electricity, but guess what? Residential electricity is only one phase. Introducing the Phasomatic, which is a silly name for a phase converter, which is a fancy name for a device that takes 240 volts single phase electricity, like what you power your stove or dryer with, and converts it to three phase electricity. Each machine has a dedicated phasomatic that I can simply plug in when I want to use that particular machine. 
While this isn't the most convenient, it's a small price to pay to have industrial machines in my residential garage. While these first four machines are definitely the biggest in terms of weight, none of them are physically the largest thing I crammed in here. That honor is reserved for the workbench. This bench has been around as long as I can remember and I used to climb around on it as a kid. Story goes that my grandfather made this bench sometime in the 50s or 60s. I know this because my mother, aunt, and uncles all remember climbing around on it when they were kids. The workbench is a single welded frame and measures roughly 3 feet by 6 feet and is 5 feet tall. The workbench also includes this vise, which to the best of my knowledge has been exactly where it's currently mounted since it was built. The surfaces are all wood, making them easily replaceable, though I don't think they would ever need to be. The amount of oil and grease worked into these boards over the years will likely preserve them until the end of time. Because the workbench is so deep, it offers a lot of storage, but this storage is only useful if I can actually get to it. So one of the key requirements of laying out the shop was that I have access all around the front and back of the bench. Seems simple enough in theory, but the building this equipment came from was roughly 40 by 80 feet, and my shop is a meager 14 by 28. That's about an eighth of square footage. So let's talk about the layout. What did I decide to use for this? Nothing but good old Excel. I know what you're thinking, Excel isn't a drafting software, but guess what? It certainly can be. It's what we in the industry call Excelocad. I drew a bunch of shapes and sized them to scale for each piece of equipment. I was then able to move them around in a bunch of different variations to find the best location for each machine. Is this essentially the same as playing with a bunch of paper cutouts like an elementary schooler? Yes. Does it make it any less of a valid technique? I think not. Some of the machines need access on certain sides. Some machines also move outside their physical envelope, like the tables on the mill and the service grinder. On top of this, I tried to lay things out so that my movements were efficient and my travel from workbench to machine was minimal. After several variations, I came up with the perfect balance. The mill is in the back corner like you've seen. The lathe is on the same wall but down a few feet. The surface grinder is on the wall opposite the mill, and the bandsaw is on the other end of the shop next to the stove. This left comfortable walkways on each side of the workbench with plenty of room to move around. But you can also probably see that there are other things going on in this layout that I haven't talked about. So let's look at some of these. To the right of the lathe is a surface plate, which is a precision ground slab of granite. This is a key component to any good machine shop because it serves as an almost perfectly flat reference plane for inspecting part dimensions and tooling setups. The surface plate is only part of the equation, however. I need some measurement equipment to go with it. Included here I have a height micrometer, a gauge block set, as well as a Cadillac gauge, which I'll be honest, I don't actually know how to use. Yet. Next to the surface plate is the drafting table. This is what draftsmen and engineers used to create drawings long before computer-aided drafting programs were even dreamed up. It includes a drafting machine which can hold a set of scales at precise angles across the whole table. This table is left exposed to drastic temperature fluctuations and as a result needs repairs to get it usable. That seems to be a running theme around here. Despite being only 30, I'm proud to say that I actually know how to use this rig, and look forward to designing on it again. Back over behind the mill is a hydraulic press, which can be used for joining and separating tightly fitted parts, as well as forming features on sheet metal. They can also come in handy when you bend something that you definitely didn't mean to. This one needs a couple of rest pins made for it, because somebody forgot to cinch them down during the big move. We'll just add that to the rapidly growing list of projects. There are a few other motorized machines in the shop, including a drill press, a bench grinder with a wire wheel, and a combination belt and disc sander. With tools in nearly every corner of this shop, one thing was certain. I was going to need a lot of light. So in true fashion, I installed way too much. Ten sets of overhead LED shop lights and I almost need to wear sunglasses in here. Fortunately, they all have individual pull chain switches, so I only have to turn them all on when I go searching for that small spring that shot out of a tool I shouldn't have been taken apart in the first place. Now with all this light, you can probably see things aren't in all that great a shape. They are rusty, greasy, dusty, and in some cases broken. There's a lot of work yet to be done to get this shop in proper working order. Fortunately, the last couple large items in this shop will help with that process. First is the parts washer, which does exactly what it sounds like. You fill it with petroleum solvent, and you can go to town on your greasy, rusty parts with Scotch-Brite pads and wire brushes. This one came with a handy little pump that pushes solvent into a wand and lets you douse your part, your hands, and yourself in a continuous stream of the cleaner. Next is a super useful thing called a blast cabinet. No, it doesn't have anything to do with explosions, but it's definitely the bomb. 
It's a sealed and ventilated booth used for sandblasting parts. If you're not familiar with sandblasting, it's actually pretty awesome. Sandblasting uses compressed air to hurl glass beads, aka sand, at the part you want to clean. It's extremely effective at removing rust and paint without really doing any harm to the metal surface underneath. In my shop, this will be used a lot, though I may have to fight my wife for booth time. So there you have it. That is all the equipment and their new home. There are a few improvements I see making and the list of projects I want to do is growing by the day. But first things first, these machines need a thorough cleaning and adjustment. Stay tuned for more videos where I'll be restoring these machines, getting them running smoothly, and relearning how they work. It's going to be a fun project. Thanks for watching.